Hopefully all of you uh, okay. got the map as well as the question and answer and uh, yeah. also then the uh, genealogy. So uh, feel free to use those as we discuss things tonight. Uh, let's stand and then begin with the prayer. Before you start, Mother, do you want us to turn off our mute? Do you want us to turn off our mute? Yes, if you would, uh, if you're... Uh, you can leave them on at the beginning, but then after we start, if you would, those of you who are on Zoom, uh, put on mute unless you're going to speak and then turn it off. This way we won't have any uh, conflict. In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Shine in our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind that we may comprehend the proclamations of your Gospels. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having trampled down all carnal desires, we may lead a spiritual life, both thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ, our God, are the illumination of our souls and bodies, and to you we offer up glory, together with your Father, who is without beginning, and your all holy, good, and life creating spirit now and forever into the ages of ages. Amen. All right, thank you. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, those of you, uh, I think most of you have met Michael, who's joining us here in person. Uh, feel free afterwards to introduce yourself if you haven't done that, but uh, welcome. And if you want to get any coffee or cake, please come up now. Do you want coffee? No. All right, we're going to turn now, uh, continue in the Gospel of Luke. You live with her. And uh, <laughs> we finished the. Uh, <laughs> what was that, Father? We finished the uh, uh, talk, uh, discussing the birth of Christ and uh, also his entrance into the temple. And so today we're going to start with the um, page one three six eight. Page 1368, Chapter 3 of the Orthodox Study Bible, the Baptist's Call for Repentance. So we're going to take the first only two verses to begin with. We're going to read Chapter 3, Verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to comment on that uh, in the question and answer. So, um, Luke, if you would... Roger, if you want to start reading there, please. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Eturiae, and the region of Trachonitis, and Nisanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. It's not Texas, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. While, while Annas and <clears throat> Caiaphas <throat> were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Okay. If you turn to the question and answer pages that we have, we're going to discuss these rulers. Uh, you heard a lot of different names there, and we would like to just to highlight the, these and get an understanding. In number 1A, Tiberius Caesar, it says the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, that was about 26 AD, 26 AD. He was the second emperor beginning in 14 AD, and I have it already answered there. Caesar Augustus was the first Roman emperor. So keep this in mind. It's Tiberius Caesar now that we hear about John the Baptist going to be involved with. The second one that you hear, of course, especially during Holy Week, Pontius Pilate. He was the governor of Judea. He was both. Now, this is important. He was not only the civil ruler, but he was the military commander. Now, that doesn't happen that often today. We're going to discuss it a little later on. The third person mentioned, Herod Ant Antipas. He was a tetrarch. A tetrarch is a ruler over what part of an area or country? Does anybody know? Province. A third? A quarter of a quarter. A tetrarch is a ruler over one quarter of a part of a country or an area. So the answer there is a quarter. 
He was the son of Herod the Great and ruled from 4 BC to 39 AD. He was the ruler over Galilee where Jesus spent most of his time ministering. So you will hear about him again. D, Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Troponitis. He was a reputable leader known as a fair and just ruler. In fact, Caesarea Philippi was built and named after him. Caesarea was where Peter made his great confession where Jesus asked his disciples, whom do you say I am? And what was Peter's answer to him? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. So again, Philip was one of these that was listed as a reputable leader. Some of these others you won't hear such a glowing um, report on. Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. Nothing of importance is known of him. There's not very much that is known of him. Now, here it gets interesting. Annas and Caiaphas. The bad boys. <laughs> the high priest. The high priest would have become political and corrupt. Political and corrupt. There was never to be more than one priest at any given time. For the priest who was supposed to be for life and was supposed to be hereditary. But with the coming of Roman rule, the high priest became a political power base. Rome used the position to secure power over Jewish life. Were they smart? Were the Roman emperors smart? <laughs> yes. Because they knew how to get through the people through whom? The, the religious the leaders. The religious leaders. All right. We'll talk a little more about that later. They offered and gave the position to men who were cooperative and willing to let the people follow Roman rule. Listen to this. There were 28 different men installed and removed as high priests wow. between 37 BC and 26 AD. Wow. Why do you think there were so many? Because they weren't cooperative. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, just, they weren't doing what the Romans yeah. wanted them to do, or they, they weren't. Were they were taking too much, maybe taking too much money off the top. Mm. Annas was still the power behind the throne, even though Caiaphas mm. was officially. The high priest. Now, what later on, we don't have time to go into it. But we, I'm sorry? There was a relationship between them two, right? Yes. Yeah. They're both high priests. Yes. But what happens is, is, let's go to the next page. We'll get, get into this a little more. The modern day country of, oh, no, wait, before you don't look at that. <laughs> go to the map. Go to the map first. Go look at the map. Now, some of these places are listed. If you look up in the, it's a yellow area to your right, I would say the northeast corner. You see tr Troconitis, all right? Uh, you see where, it, now up in the northern part, Iturea, I-T-U-R-E-A, all right? And then you go all the way down to, you see jo Judea in the southwest corner in Idumea. Now, below, right in the southern part, is what we would call the Arabian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So this is the Holy Land. Yeah. All right, this is the Holy Land. Now, you see Samaria there, Judea, you see Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. It gives you an idea of where a lot of this was taking place. Whenever you hear today about the Gaza Strip, for example, look down there in the left-hand corner. If you see, it says Gaza. Yeah. All right. So uh -huh. now if you turn back, keep the map open and turn to page two in the question and answer. The modern day country of Israel is 263 miles from north to south. And it rain, its width ranges from 71 miles at its widest point to 9.3 miles at it, as its narrowest point. Is that very large? No. no. What United States state Rural. would be si similar in size? No, uh, Close. Not in location, but in size. What's another small state? Massachusetts, Delaware. New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey probably is the closest in size. to it. That puts it in perspective. So when you think of Israel today, the modern state, think of New Jersey in terms of size. 
Anybody want to guess at its population? Approximately. How many million? Today? Today. Today. Seven million? Yes. It's six million seven hundred ninety-seven thousand. Wow. Seven million. Uh, less, less than seven million. Israel. Israel. Israel, yes. Now, what Muslim country today still has a religious leader as its political leader also? Iran. Yeah. Iran. Yeah. What do we call him? Ayatollah. 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 All right. Yeah. And now, are there any predominantly orthodox countries in which the political ruler is closely aligned with the religious leaders? How about Greece? Does that exist today? No. 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 In fact, how would you describe the relationship between the religious head of Greece and the political head of Greece? Is it close? Is it indifferent? I mean, there's no right answer, though, so... I don't know. I'm asking you. Well, why I'm sorry, I was, I was trying to... Yeah. What, what is the relationship between the head of the church in Greece and the head of the political, the very prime very minister very in very Greece? Good. Why just separate? Not too good. Separate, yes. Not too good. All right. Now, Elena's not here. In Russia, at least the times I've been there, and Elena can verify this, it's still separate, but Putin is pretty close to the head, to the patriarch, to mm -hmm. the and they work in conjunction. Now, now the question becomes: Which Is that which patriarch are you referring to? Kirill, Russian. Okay. Yeah. Moscow. In Moscow. Mm -hmm. So he is somewhat close. Now, in some of the former communist countries, the Republic of Georgia, Bulgaria, Romania, etc. I would say Romania and probably Bulgaria to a certain extent would be more like Greece today. Not anta antagonistic, but not closely yeah. as closely aligned. All right. Mm -hmm. um, then you can get into Ukraine and so forth. There's others, you know, that we could go into that are predominantly orthodox. Would Russia today be like doing the czars, where the patriarch and the czars work together? No, no, it's not to that closeness yet. Now, don't forget, it would go back and forth depending on who was in charge at that time. And so for today, it would be, go ahead, Mary. Sorry, I was a piece off. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what would happen is um, today, they have a very good relationship in terms of, if you ever see Putin, you'll see him in church yeah. yes. and you will see him with the patriarch when, when necessary. Uh, what I was impressed with, was when I was there the last time in probably 2003, I was working with the military chaplains in Moscow and uh, they were dedicating, they have a church dedicated to the chaplains, to the military, not only chaplains, but all the military. And it, they are so supportive, the government of the church there. It is amazing. They are taking, I read another article recently where they just had another church that was destroyed during the communists for the most part, and they now gave it back to the church, and they are rebuilding that entire. There are so many churches that have come back to the church, church buildings that have been given back to the church, that I'm really impressed. Now, what relationship, well, even before we go to that, would you say that it's good to have a close relationship between the head of a state or country politically and the head of the church in that country? No. And if so, if you say yes, why? If you say no, why? Yeah. Dark, dark? Well, uh, the church has to be all by itself, not to interfere with the political um, situation. Or so the church you're saying should be by itself yeah. separate and not yeah. interfere politically, yeah. why? Well, uh, that is a better uh, because church business is different from the political business. So they, they should not be interference. The only one that they have close relationship with was when we were Basilia, when we have the royalties, which we stopped having them since 1963 uh -huh. okay in greece 1963 was 1963 was the day that date. they left uh, greece they took them out uh -huh. and they went to another country okay so many different countries yes anyway 
Um, so <clears throat> the church, it was with the royalties in nice relationship, not that they were accommodate them, mm -hmm. but always they have a close, uh, uh, very nice relationship. Yeah. A harmonious relationship harmonious, for the most part. Right. Yeah. So what you're saying, it's good that the church in Greece and is separate from the political and the political separate from the right. church. Right. And it, it, you could still work together on that. Right. Okay. Yes. I think ideally. Yes. The two would coexist and work together because we should lead our lead our lives and even the country by the same our way. values and our moral values. However, in reality, no. I just don't even see it happening with we humans. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is, if you have an ideal situation, yeah. you would have the government listening to its religious leaders and actually having the same value system, the right. same moralistic values, etc., that then you would have yeah. a harmonious situation. Yeah. If we had Christian. Right. This is a Christian nation. I don't care what something our previous president said. Um, you can't speak for And I'm not getting political. I'm just taking mm -hmm. what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'm not a member of either party. Any party. <laughs> My point is that the country should be following God. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so if we have God's people and the leaders of the church and it's, it's whatever country it is, <coughs> and we have the right people in government, it should be a congenial relationship. Mm -hmm. But government not interfering with church. And she said, church wait a minute, let me, let me speak to that if you can, because um, I don't mean to be abrupt here. When we say politics, the church shouldn't get involved in politics. I'd like to say something that's really heavy on that. That was the problem in this country for many, many years. Church and state separated. They would say, oh, you can't say anything about this terrible issue or that terrible issue because that's political. No, it's morally right and wrong issues that the church should speak of. And when they don't, and horrible things are done to humanity because they don't want to get political, see, that's mis been misunderstood a lot. And I think that we as Christians, if we look in the Bible, we look in the examples, and tonight we're studying John the Baptist, who better to see mm -hmm. exactly what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Can I say something? Can I say something? Yeah. Everybody's talking, myself, everybody. Yeah. We should support the church, we should support the religion, the whatever, whatever, whatever. But we just speak among us. Nobody's out there. Nobody's out there saying, no, this is it. Mm -hmm. This is it. I know. You I know? know. Mm -hmm. Nobody's protesting anything. Mm -hmm. that's, Nobody's that's disappointing. It is disappointing. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is very disappointing. They're getting yeah. lockstep with everything. It is disappointing because now they have gone like this. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's an interesting discussion. There's not going to be an easy answer now. What, <laughs> what, what was the United States formed form originally for? When the people came over here from Europe, what was one of the major reasons they <laughs> left? Freedom, Freedom of religion. Yeah. <laughs> now, whose religion? Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. now, if you were living probably 20 years ago, what would be the problem if you were living in England or Ireland? Oh boy. Big one. <laughs> Catholics versus Anglicans. What was the problem there? Catholics versus Protestants. Catholics versus Protestants. And both and they, Christian. Uh, and both Christian. Both Christian. What was the problem during the Crusades? It was an issue that started out between Christians going to go take over from the Muslims, and on the way to there, they stopped in Constantinople and they did some not so good things. There's still relics and everything else missing. In other words. A lot of things are done in the name of God that are negative. And a lot of the governments do things negatively and sometimes used in the name of God. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's a balancing situation. Now, after you have people coming over here, in the especially the early generations, 
Most of them were from where? Europe. Mm -hmm. Most of them, would you say, were what we would call Protestant or Roman Catholic? In the beginning? Yeah. Protestant. Protestant. Yeah. All right. Then you get Roman uh, Catholics yeah. coming yeah. in. And then, God forbid, the Orthodox coming in the, <laughs> the third wave, you know, coming over from Greece and Russia yeah, and all yeah, over. Exactly. And second. So, and then, oh, by the way, what else do we have besides Christians? Islam. Jews, Muslims, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus. Atheists. All right. Now, ha, would you say the situation in America has worked pretty well up to this point? Up till no. recently. Up till recently. Yeah, no. And you would say no. How many would say yes? And how many would say no? So it depends on your point of view. All right. Now the question becomes, is any of us apolitical? Are, are, can we actually say, I'm not political at all? It depends on how we define the term politics. Okay. In other words, if, if I said, all right, this is what I believe, who would yeah. we as Orthodox Christians base okay. our beliefs on? Would it be the government? Or Jesus Christ. Exactly. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So if whether you're Republican, Democrat, exactly. independent, whatever, you would hope you would make your decisions on whom you vote for, not necessarily, which most people do, by the person as much as what is the policy of that particular party. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. You see what I'm saying? What are their platforms? What is the platform for whatever party? I don't care what it is, libertarian, whatever. Most people will not, if you ask them, what is the platform of, and you fill in the blank, yeah. even if they're of that party, it may be difficult for them to say, now, let's be honest. We have a president right now who um, is officially, what is his religion? Catholic. Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Is there an issue on whether he is allowed to receive communion now? Big, big yes. time. Yep. Big time. Why? Abortion. Because of one issue. Abortion. Abortion. Mm -hmm. For he's for mm -hmm. the right of <clears throat> women to choose whether they have one or not. Mm -hmm. And there's been, excuse me, Marks, there's been yeah. bishops, especially in the United States, who say to the Pope, you should not allow exactly. him now. The one who is in D.C. has given him permission to receive. He was formerly in Atlanta. And we knew him. I attended many services with him in Metropolitan Alexia. He's now in uh, Washington, D.C. And I saw the other day where he is, uh, Gregory, giving them, he's a cardinal now, giving him permission. Marcos. I was going to say, uh, I've heard Biden say, I, don't want, I, I should be saying this, because this is political. <laughs> I heard him say we won't go too far. After, yeah. yeah, that's right. He probably went back. <laughs> after he went to see the Pope, and then he went to on say, the Pope says, I'm a pretty good Catholic. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't want to get political <laughs> yeah. here. What I'm trying to do is show how yeah. difficult yeah. it is to live in a country where, for example, let's take the opposite. Let's say you go to Saudi Arabia <laughs> or you go to one of the countries that's predominantly Muslim. Do you think you will? Is there any question on what the role of religion is there? <laughs> no. So you still see situations where, in, depending on the country, there's going to be a predominant religion. Now, let's take a very strong Roman Catholic country, Poland. All right. You still have the Orthodox churches. I remember one Orthodox uh, young man telling me when I was uh, working with their chaplains, he said, I would love to live in a country where Orthodoxy was the predominant religion. Uh -huh. I said, well, we know how you feel living in America. We make up less than 1% of the population in the United States, Orthodox, <laughs> all Orthodox, less than 1%. Maybe one, it used to be 2%, the Jews in the same situation, the Muslims in the same situation. So when you look at it, up till recently, you would have, let's say, maximum 6% Jewish, Orthodox Christian, and Muslim. That's six, all right? Normally, they would say 26% were Roman Catholic. Now it's down to 25. So you're up to 31. 
and Protestant was generally about 40%. So let's say you have 60%. What does that say about the other 40%? Yeah. They are non-religious. They're, they're going to put down maybe no denomination. Uh -huh. We call them nuns. N-O-N-E. Uh -huh. uh -huh. All right. 40%. Yeah, about 40. And it's growing. Oh, yeah. It's growing. All you have That's to do sad. is to look at the statistics. Mm -hmm. and they, I love to see them. It's not that I love to look at the, uh, what would you call it? The uh, demographics. demographics and so forth, but I don't like the results. If you look at what's growing, it's the religion Muslim. of the nuns. Okay. N-O-N-E-S. Yeah. No religious no preference. Religious. Okay. But as Jesus said, there's much harvest to be done. Oh, yeah. In fact, it, it's, this is an interesting point because the challenge then is on us mm -hmm. as Christians, yeah. as people of faith, even uh, let's say Jewish Muslim, as people of faith, we have to let people see what we believe and whether they see it in our behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult because you will be working or you have worked with or you will entertain or you'll have neighbors or whatever of uh, whatever background. And they're always watching, whether we realize it or not. They're listening. And it's up to us to either be a good example of what we believe or not. So you can see now what happened in 325 with the Emperor Constantine. What did he do? He legalized Christianity. 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 Yeah. Up to that point, it was only legal to worship which gods? Caesars. Pagans. Mm -hmm. The pagan gods. Mm -hmm. All right? The emperor. And so you had to burn incense in front of the emperor. So now, in 318, with the mm -hmm. Edict of Milan, mm -hmm. Constantine goes and says, Christianity is on equal par. Now, the good thing about that is, up to a certain point, you had legal status. Did the persecution stop? No. No. <laughs> no. And it got to the point of where sometimes if you ever look, you look at the carpets that we have in the altar, in many churches on the solea, you will see what kind of eagle? Double-headed eagle. Why? Church and state. Church and state. <clears throat> Church and state. What country uses that mostly today? It used to be a Byzantine thing, but not today. It's Russia. You look at the emperor and you will see that quite often. So there was always the church and the state. And the question became, what is the relationship between those two heads? And it's still in controversy today. Now, is it going to go one way or the other in the United States? We can only conjecture. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the future holds. What Marco said is important. We need to do our part, mm -hmm. you know, and hope and pray for the best, etc. Now, should you ever lose hope? No. 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 That's no. why we're living for. That's what we're living for. God is still in charge. Yes. Christ will reign at the second coming. So no matter what happens, even if we were martyred tomorrow, mm -hmm. glory be to God. That's all we can say. Glory be to God. The only thing that we have to be concerning ourselves for is this judgment day when he says to us, yeah. whom did you say I was? Mm -hmm. Did you believe in me as the son of God, mm -hmm. as the Messiah or not? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't care. He can ask the same question to all these other people, but we still have to ask answer for ourselves. Yeah. So when you look at this map and you think of what's going on in the world today, what was going on in the world at that time? Has anything really changed? <laughs> no, there's still what? Conflict. Humans. There's still conflict, you know? And even there. And corruption. And corruption. And so even there, where obviously in, in Israel, what is the predominant religion? Judaism. Judaism. All right. Do they still have controversies over that? Look at who's in charge. Is it the Orthodox Jews? Or is it the Reformed? Is it the Conservative? You see the point I make. So, this is what Jesus was born into. This is what Jesus was born into. Yeah. Just something I saw in the news a few, four years ago. 
the Muslims, they gathered in New York City, and they're taking, I don't know how many blocks of streets, and they'll fall down and do whatever their prayers. And nobody's yeah. No, no. Why the Christians have been stopped for doing their thing? Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing today. It's uh, I would say that Christians are being looked upon. If you would say in the press and in the media and so forth, is uh, their view of Christianity positive or negative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Negative. <laughs> negative. It seems like if you're a minority religion, is yeah. well, let me ask you this. What about even though Judaism is a uh, minority religion, what is the media, how do they treat? It's not very good either. So it's almost like unless if you're uh, Jewish or Christian, you're going to get a negative press, generally speaking. Yeah. Generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Now, where it becomes important is... And, and this is why when I asked you before, can anybody say I am not political at all? The answer is no, we're all political. Because politics means involvement with two different people over a subject matter. Where it becomes important is when you are serving in government positions. So there are, in the Orthodox Church, um, and I would have to get this clarified, but for the most part, if Father Stavros or I wanted to run for office and become a senator or a a representative in Florida or in the United States, we would have to get permission from the bishop and most likely resign as being a parish priest. Oh, yeah. We would not be able to continue in that. Right. Now, in the Protestants, it's not as big as an issue. They'll allow you, you'll hear about different mm -hmm. reverend, you know, now obviously Reverend Sharpton <laughs> is a big one that you'll hear about, you know, and Reverend Jesse Jack. You can go down the list. The point is, we would not be allowed to be in that situation. We probably would have to resign, mm -hmm. resign, you know, always a priest, but I mean, you would have to then be separate. The other place that becomes important, and you're seeing it right now, Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. I give credit for those people now who would want to become a justice there to go through what they have gone through in the um, confirmation. confirmation yeah. process. And I give people credit who can stay say, I am Roman Catholic, I am Methodist, I am an or or whatever, and say, this is my belief. <clears throat> I give them credit, and that's where I say they are standing up. And will that influence their decisions just like some other? Of course, of course. and it should. Mm -hmm. It should. Yeah. All right? Where we get concerned, going back to what we started out with, is when you get to the point of where you have no belief, mm -hmm. and then anything goes right. Mm -hmm. And that could happen very easily. So that's it there. You answered all those questions there. And let's go on to chapter three, verses wow. three to six. <laughs> Angela, if you would start reading there, please. Oh, yeah, let me see where we <clears throat> Three, three to six. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance <clears throat> for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Okay, if you bring out your map again and then we're going to look at 2A there. It says in the surrounding country of the um, Jordan, probably just north of the Dead Sea. Look in the middle toward the south, and you will see the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. Those of you who were here the other day when Archbishop of mm -hmm. Force was here in uh, Metropolitan Alexios, um, I don't know if it was here in Tampa or was it over at St. Stephanos, but no, it was here. Was it here? Alexios yeah. was talking about it. Alexios was talking about it, how it's uh, very salty, nothing grows there mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Dead Sea, etc. But you see how uh, long it is there. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the surrounding country of the Jordan. Now, if we were to sum up in B, what was John's message in one word? What would be the one word? Repent. Repent. Yeah. Repent. All right. That's the answer there. And what was the first message of Jesus in one word? Repent. Repent. <laughs> they both. Both. All right. Now, the question, why was John's call in C for Jews to repent so controversial? Why was John's call for Jews to repent so controversial? 
Because they thought they were God's children. Yeah. Okay, they thought they were God's children. And who needed to repent in their eyes? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. The Gentiles. So, let me just read this section here. <clears throat> Proclaiming that Jews should be baptized was very controversial indeed, for until then, only Gentiles were offered baptism as a part of their conversion to Judaism. So even at that time, baptism is not just Christian. Baptism was used by a lot of different religions for the washing, the cleansing, and then the receiving into. So that Gentiles had to be baptized to become Jews. Most people don't think about that. In those days, when a Gentile wanted to leave his sinful ways and become a Jew, he stated his desire to the local Jewish community, promising to keep all the law. After being circumcised, he was then baptized, immersing himself in water to wash away the stain of the Gentile world. Wow. You see that? Just, it's just the opposite of what we're, okay? Uh, just as Jews sometimes immerse themselves to wash away ceremonial uncleanness, in Leviticus chapter 14. The converting Gentile was then considered a Jew. After that, this baptism was the model for John's baptism of his fellow Jews. John heralded to all Israel that the Jews were as much in need of repentance as was the Gentiles. Do you think they wanted to hear that? No. no. No, the messianic kingdom was at hand, but the Jews were not ready to receive it. If Messiah came now and found Israel unprepared, he would come in judgment and wrath, not in reward and salvation. Let Israel repent. If any Jew responded to John's call for repentance, that person was to show that repentance by accepting baptism, trusting in the Messiah, he would have the forgiveness of sins spared. So in other words, you can see the controversy that John was bringing. <clears throat> he was saying, Wake up, Jews. The repentance is for you. Right for you. In your face time mm -hmm. thing. Who among the Jews would not want to hear that? What group of people? The Pharisees. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders. Yeah. You're taking, you're telling us? <laughs> yeah, it's serious here. <laughs> you must be kidding me. You know, so you see what's on. Could John remit sins? No. 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 All right, let's read the Orthodox Study Bible 3.3 3 there, uh, Angela, if you would. The call to repentance was traditional for prophets. John's baptism did not grant remission of sins once and for all, but prefigured and prepared people for the baptism of Christ, which was to come. John is the figure of the law in that, like the law, he denounced sin, but could not remit sin. Both John and the law point to the one who can remit sin. Okay. John and the law pointed to the one. Now, even in the prayer that the priests use in the Orthodox Church, he says, and may God forgive the servant of God. In other words, it's Christ forgiving. The priest is there representing Christ, but it's Christ who can forgive only there. Now, which people <clears throat> shall see the salvation of God? It's taken there from uh, verse 6. And all, yeah. no, I gave you the answer. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. All flesh. Oh. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is now, Christ is coming, opening up to all people. This is going to get the Jews upset. They want the Messiah to be their own political and religious leader. They want to be ruling, etc. And he's saying, I have come and going to offer my life for all people. Okay, Bill, how about reading chapter 3, verses 7 to 9? Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And now that the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay. 
Was John's message here very blunt or very accommodating? Very blunt. Very blunt. <laughs> he was telling it as it is. This is what's going to happen. What two main points did he make in verses 7 to 9 there? What was he telling people? The one was just, just because you're uh, a descendant of Abraham. It doesn't mean you have a, a special ticket. Yeah. You don't get a free ride into heaven. Yeah. Just because you are a, a descendant of Abraham. So it doesn't depend on from whom you came. It depends on the life that you live and how you believe. What else? What's going to happen? Brings up children to Abraham from their stones. Yes. And so, even now the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Trees. Every yeah. tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down. Oh, okay. What does that, way. if you were to use, uh, oh. think of one word and it begins with a J, what is that leading toward? J. Judgment. Judgment. Oh, okay. Exactly. <laughs> Judgment. There will be a day of reckoning. And the good will be put on one side, the evil on the other. The grain will be separated from the chaff. The tree that bears fruit will be on one side. The tree that doesn't bear fruit. Remember the fig tree? Yeah. 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 Remember all? So you start to see what happens here. Let's read the note down there, uh, Bill, for 3.8. 3.8? Mm -hmm. While parents and ancestors help in part piety and holiness. Ancestry itself does not make one worthy of God. Okay, we just said that. Keep going. Each person in every generation must bear fruits worthy of repentance. Stones symbolize the Gentiles will become children to Abraham through faith in Christ. So when you see the word stones there, read that uh, if you, again if you would there in verse 9. Therefore... It says, therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the uh, fire. Uh, let me go. Where was the stone? Before I say to you. Oh, yeah. R read that. Uh, Denise. Before I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from trees, from these stones. From these stones. In other words, even the Gentiles are going to be able to be raised up as they live a, the decent life, the Christian right. life, follow Christ. <laughs> So you start to see again the broadening of Christ to all people. He came to die for each and every one of us. Any comments on that? On the next page, uh, page three. We're going to read now 310 to uh, 14. Uh, Bill, keep reading there if you would for the next 10 to 14. So the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, he who has two tonics, tunics, tunics, let him give to, to him. <laughs> I believe you didn't say gin and tonic. He has a hangover from New Year's. Go ahead, Bill. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics. <laughs> Let him give to him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall I we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Okay. Now, 3A, uh, no, 4A, how does John answer the people's question on what they must do? When you read uh, giving, uh, if you have two tunis, give one away, and you ask food, let him do likewise, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What would we say? He is emphasizing two things there. What sharing. Would, sharing, okay. And what we would call that sharing stewardship, it comes down to show mercy on people. So that's the one of the answers there. Show mercy. Be merciful, forgive them, help them, share with them what you have. And he says to the others, do not intimidate anyone to the soldiers. Don't accuse falsely. Be content. What is the other thing that mercy goes with that we all want to have? Begins with a J. Justice. Christ will be just. And he will be merciful. That's almost like two sides of the coin. Yeah. And they, they, you weigh them. Now, we always want to ask for, of course, mercy. 
but he will be a just God. And there are ramifications, there are consequences of our actions, our behaviors, etc. So he is emphasizing mercy and justice. Now, if you go uh, to Micah six uh, eight, let me get it here. Six eight. Eight. Uh, let's see, one zero. Zero 08, page 1008, chapter 6, verse 8. 1008, Micah, and I'll just read it for you, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord seek from you but to do justly and to love mercy and to be ready to walk with the Lord your God? That's a very famous, you will hear different translations for that. But if you go to a Christian bookstore, you will always see Micah 6 8. You will see Micah 6 8. And they usually uh, shorten the translation Love mercy, show justice, and walk humbly with your God. Now, the other thing is uh, on page uh, 1677. If you turn to, uh, quickly, I can read it again. 1677 in the book of James. We're going to hear something similar, and, and it's nice because you go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and you find out that the same message is, is there, just in different words. So in James 3.17, I'm going to read from 3.17 on page 1677. It says here, um, let me start with, uh, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. The same message mm -hmm. in just different words. Mm -hmm. Beautifully put by James, beautifully put by Micah, two different time periods, two different translations, the same message. They'll read the note there on 315 to 17, the Orthodox Study Bible. What page? Um, one, three, six, nine, nine, and what, uh, 16 to 17. Fire in this context has a primary meaning of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, wait, 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 we didn't read that yet. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Before we go there, I, I was going to actually read, uh, before we read the note. Are there any questions, though, before we go into that, um, in what we just finished on there? What do you think about where he says to the soldiers? Uh, where he says, do not intimidate anyone to accuse falsely and be content with your wages. What do you think of that? Like, don't be greedy or don't ask. Don't In other words, don't yes, misuse your power. Don't misuse yeah. your power. Don't be greedy. Don't. Yeah. You're going to get paid for. Now, this is interesting because remember where uh, Christ talks the parable where he hires some people early in the morning and they work for the day. Mm -hmm. Then he hires people couple hours later and they work the rest of the day and then some others hired later and what does he pay all of them the same the same. <laughs> now does that sound right no, no what's the point he's trying to make though they, they agree, agree to it, it. They they agree to it. it. Yeah. Yeah. he gave them the opportunity so it's almost like let your yes be yes and your no be no you know i always have problem with that one because to me, you want to say, well, wait a minute, you know? Yeah. And it's, it reminds me of the prodigal son in a way. You know, there you have the, the, uh, the boy who works, the older son works hard and all, because all might kills himself and whatnot. I'm very loyal. But I think it's also like, don't be concerned with trivial stuff, like yeah. the it, money or earning money here. Like What happens, think, let's say all of you were hired at a um, one hour interval. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I said, you're all getting paid equal. Who are you wanting to come after you. <laughs> yeah. right. What does it do among you? Yeah, it divides you. Yeah. It divides you, and you start fighting among yourself. Hey, you owe me some money because you got, or vice versa, you owe him some money because you hired last. Yeah. You see what happens yeah. is when you start, how do we do that today? How do we do that as an individual or families today? To whom do we compare ourselves? Maybe to other workers or something, if somebody was hired at a higher pay. And usually, do we pay, compare ourselves to somebody below us or above us? Above. Above. Yeah. Are we any different? Greedy. Greedy. 
We're still, yeah. and, you know, we talked about this many times. How much money is enough? Just a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. I don't care if you're making 100,000, 1,000, 100, 10 million, or a billion. Just a little bit more. <laughs> and that's what happens is, think, I don't know about you, but I'm sure you all have stories. Think about your grandparents and your parents and what they had or didn't have and what they existed on and how they got bought. And then think of what you are doing. And then think of how you want to make it better for your children. And so it's it's just natural to want to improve, get, you know, maybe get more of an education and this and that and so forth, uh, get a better position, which is okay. It's okay. It's when you have to be careful is you could be at any level at this level, this level, this level, and this level, and you still may not be at peace with yourself. It's not a matter of how much you have, it's whether you are satisfied with what you have. Because there could be poor people who are very angry and very envious and, and maybe even willing to set off a bomb and say, I'm going against Wall Street. They could be just as bad as the guy on the top who doesn't even see Lazarus at the doorstep. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So it has nothing to do with your strata, mm -hmm. socially or economically or politically. It has to do with what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, when it says be content, Paul talks about this too, with what you have. So it doesn't mean don't better yourself, mm -hmm. but don't become greedy. Mary. I don't want um, just talk about the good so they can hear you on that. I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but um, a lot of times we want Christ to be fair. Yes. Where yes. He's, he's not, he never, I don't think he promised us fairness. Right. But he promised us mercy and justice. Correct. Right? And Correct. Then just a spinoff, like in the schools, the kids are so, well, everybody, you know, has to be fair, it has to be across the board. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's like our kids are so, so different. There's no way being, you can't be fair. Mm -hmm. You know, you would be unfair in being fair. Yes. You know? yeah. yes. 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 But um, anyway, I don't know if that's on. That's track. a very good point. What you said is very good. Uh, Mary here said with the kids she teaches and all, a lot of the kids will ask for fairness. Let everything be fair. And what uh, Mary says is that. Christ said he will be just and merciful. He didn't say fair. Although justice would assume some type of fairness. But what I say to everybody is once you accept the fact that life is not fair, you will be able to deal with life a lot better. Because you won't be frustrated. And oh, by the way, there is um, there's not fairness in everything in life. And who is it hurt when you get mad? Yourself. You hurt yourself for getting mad and angry at the fact that life is not fair. And so that's the key to it, I think, we have to look at. Good point. Very good. All right. Um, let's read then verse uh, chapter 3, verses. What did you just read, Bill? You want to read 3, 16, 17. 15 to 17. Okay, 15 to 17. In the, in the notes? Or? No, we have to read no, read this, uh, this uh, main part. Main part, okay. Oh, yeah. Now is the people. Yeah. John 16, sorry, John. No, Luke, we're in Luke. Luke. 1369. Yeah, man, basically. Now, as the people yes. were in expectation, mm -hmm. and all reason in their hearts about John, oh, yeah. whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now read the note on six, 3, 16 to 17, please. Fire in this context has the primary meaning of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is given to the world of Pentecost. It further declares the judgment of Christ, in which the faithless, the both enlightened, will, no, will, will burn. burn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Note that this fire is one. It is the same power and the same spirit, which both enlivens the faithful and destroys the faithless. That's important. In other words, the Holy Spirit 
and the fire associated with it went on the icon of Pentecost many times. And well, let's take the baptism. What was the, uh, how was the Holy Spirit portrayed when Jesus was baptized in the form of a dove? On Pentecost, when you see the flames coming out, they're the flames of fire. Now, this is interesting because it says here in what he just read in the note, which is true. Note that the, this fire is one. It is the same power and the same spirit which both enlivens the faithful and destroys the faithless. It is said that on Judgment Day, on Judgment Day, we will be in the presence of Christ. And this is the same thing. For those who believe, it will be paradise. And for those who don't, it will be eternal damnation. It's the same thing here. Same thing. It's either or. But more, the presence could be good news to those, bad news to those. It's not he. It's his presence that he is there. It's what we did. So that's why I, when we say about it, we can only blame ourselves, either for good or for bad. All he's doing, in a sense, is pronouncing what we've already done. So we have to work from now very hard. Exactly. <laughs> well, we, have, we still have a few days left. <laughs> Some of us less than more, Bill. Christ is all present. So on the one hand, it's a blessing. Right. On the other hand, we're in, it's a curse. It's a curse. <laughs> Same thing. Why, why do you say curse, Bill? Why do you say curse? I, I just because think. if we reject Christ, right. we're damning ourselves. And, and we don't go so. with his commands and his uh, holiness, but what we're supposed to do during our lifetime, what we expect to go to paradise, Mm -hmm. I don't think so. You have to do good deeds during your lifetime mm -hmm. while you still have time before you right. are and your maker meet each other. And the one thing, go ahead. Oh, no. Just, so the, Bill was saying it's a curse because, like, we're not going to slide anything past. Nothing's going to go unnoticed. No. It's all being no, if we reject, noticed. If we reject Christ yeah. and don't live a Christ like life, we're condemning ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So on the one hand, we're condemning ourselves. On the other hand, we're blessed if we follow Christ and live a Christ-like life. Mm -hmm. And it's you to what you are going to choose. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. yes. You have the yes, free will. up to me. Yeah. 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 Not up to him. Yeah. No, no, no. Right. And that's why genealogy doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. And what you have to be careful of, and I feel bad about this too, many mm -hmm. times. I'll go to do a funeral. And they'll say, well, Father, he or she was baptized in the church. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, at that point, I, I always give the benefit of the doubt and so forth. But it's a sad testimony. It's almost like just because they were baptized, they could have lived a terrible life afterwards. But because they were baptized, they deserve this. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and it's a tough pastoral situation many times for a priest. And you, want, you always want to think of the family that remains. And try yeah. to help them because you can't do anything for the person already. So you, you say to yourself, how can I work with this family to try and get them involved again yeah. in the church? But the baptism is the beginning. It's only the beginning. Okay. Only it's the up beginning. to you. What are you going to yes. do during your lifetime? Mm -hmm. In the Jewish terms, what was the beginning for the males? Sure. Circumcision. Sure. Circumcision. Yeah. All right. So somebody yeah. could say, I'm Jewish. Yeah. yeah. But if they don't live the life according to the Jewish faith in God, mm -hmm. are they Jewish? Mm -hmm. no, really. So when you think about it, what determines Jewishness? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? It's You have to ask that. Yes. What determines being Christian? Mm -hmm. It's not just the initial act. It's what you do mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. Just like when a person comes to confession, you feel very good. You feel relieved. You feel free. You feel like a bird. And then I usually tell people, be prepared now because this is when the devil's going to come after you the most. You've just freed yourself up from all of this stuff. Now you're going to be attacked. So 
get ready. You know, put on the armor of God. And don't let it fit. Yeah, do the best you can. Yeah. By the way, I read a good article today on that particular uh, message. Uh, uh, the question was, and we'll use this for another discussion. The question to the priest was, <clears throat> why should I keep coming back to confession when I keep saying the same sin? Right. So we'll use that as a separate discussion. But remind me, because there were at least three articles I read today in this one uh, thing I got online that is, they're excellent. And I want to use yes. that in that I context. Was to get I, I'm still, Mary. Bill said something that just really touched me. Good. Um, but maybe I'm hearing it wrong. Okay. You said, I thought I heard you say Christ is always present. He is. Okay? All right. And, but there's also the presence of Christ. Okay. And we can, we experience that presence. And I know he's, He's everywhere present at all times, but there's there's no way anybody can be in that state. You know what I'm saying? You're talking in about that, two different things now. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. Exactly you're talking about two different exactly things. Like he is present always, right? But we, how we engage yeah. him to be oh, present with exactly. us right. is yeah. another thing. Oh, right. yeah. and, and that's interesting right. because sometimes, and then. Keep your thought. Here's the beauty about that. Sometimes you can invite him in, like when we say the prayer to the Holy Spirit, and come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls. Or the Holy Spirit may do one like Gabriel did to Mary. He may choose to come and make himself known to you. All you could do at that point is receive it. That's grace. That's grace. When he comes, when you, and I think what you're getting to is you're going to experience certain times in your life, they may be very few, right. when you're going to be on a high where you say, I just feel like Christ is in me. Mm -hmm. That's grace. And then there are other times that you may have, what, for whatever reason, it could be, I've had people tell me I was just moved by the service. Mm -hmm. I was moved by this or whatever. They had a personal thing when they're out in a mountaintop where they <laughs> felt Christ there. Go ahead. Now I, I want to backtrack. This all started with your statement. You started, I, started it. You started it. <laughs> <laughs> you started it. And now I'm the spirit. No, no, no. no. Okay, so <laughs> I'm the really father. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I got you nailed. Go ahead, go ahead, Mary. So um, you talked about um, in heaven, one word. Yes. One, final judgment. Yes. Okay. Yes. And either we can accept the presence of Christ, okay. So how? Well, at that point, it's too late. Well, it's no, too late. In other words, His presence no. there at Judgment Day, mm -hmm. it will be just mm -hmm. a pronouncing of what's going to happen. And so, in at that point, it, at that point, it's I don't want to say it's over, oh, yeah. but but it's over. But okay, <laughs> but, but, okay so we had fifty ninety years to yes, prior right, correct, correct presence. Right. The the wanting of Christ. That's right. We die and now we're in judgment. Yes. So I guess it's really a time and space thing. Like yeah. how how do you stay on earth? There's no way we can stay in that state. State. Every minute of Christ. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. no. So yeah. here we are going to be in heaven yeah. with that availability. That's kind of all there is, right? Yeah. And either you're going to really want it or you're just going to be frustrated at all. The people who will be in heaven will be doing one thing, praising God. The only thing we're created for here on earth is to worship God. And so there'll be no need to do anything. All we'll be doing is singing holy, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's why we say if you don't like coming to church now, you're not going to like heaven. <laughs> You're not going to like heaven. But I think what you're saying is you're thinking that all these people are up there in heaven being judged. It's not. No. No, this no, no, judgment no. is happening oh, yeah, somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, no, so they no. didn't get to heaven yet. So the people already up there are going to be rejoicing. Right, right, the people right. in but, hell are going to be lamenting. Right, because they, it's kind yeah. of like the they, chasm. they see it, but they can't. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. 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 Wait, hold on. Let her finish up. Let her finish up. More than holy, holy, holy. I mean, that's great. I'm sorry, but... Okay, well, I tell you what. There's no, no coffee hour. <laughs> <laughs> no coffee. There, there will be fellowship without the coffee. <laughs> oh, 
Well, you know what, though? There was a song when I was growing up. In heaven, there is no beer. That's why we drink beer. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard that song, but I, I can sing a few bars. It's a folk. It's a folk. In heaven, there is no beer. That's why we drink beer. It's better. As far as forgiveness. Okay. I'll figure it out. Yeah. Why do we have a memorial after the people die? Yeah, that's a good <clears throat> Why, I mean, for two reasons. Okay. What would be one? To help them resolve. Help them and can you do anything to help them necessarily? No, no, I don't want to pray. No. No. But who could you who to whom are we praying? Christ. And for and to Christ, Christ. for what? To intercede for, for mercy. 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 It's to Christ for mercy. mercy. It's mercy. not to change their state. Because on just that state, yeah. remember the rich man and Lazarus. The chasm, uh, Lazarus up here, rich man down here. So what happens is we pray, and for also then it's for uh, to help the person, but through the mercy of Christ for help the, 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 the family that's left. The second group we pray for is the family that's there. They're going through a grieving process, and that process could take months, it could take years, it could take whatever, and the big thing, there's one word also. It begins with an R. Okay. Repentance. Remembrance. 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 When every time we have the liturgy on Sunday, we are doing the anaphora, which is the remembrance of the last Supper, mm -hmm. the Holy Supper. So it's always in remembrance of this. That's why we say, in other words, may their memory be remembered, eternal, eternal. So you always have to remember it's for the prayers are to Christ, to have mercy on the soul, and help the family deal with the grief. But 40 years later? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. even yeah. my mother, who you know, off yeah. the boat was like, Yeah, didn't yeah, quite now understand. the point is, <laughs> let me ask you this Yeah, do you pray for your departed living every day? No, you I should. Don't. I, don't. I don't, you should don't. have a list, oh. have a list, uh -huh. and have living and departed. Mm -hmm. And what you should do is you should <clears throat> remember them daily. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember a lot of people from different parishes and so forth. So there's that. But let's just take your family and close friends. Mm -hmm. Start with them. Mm -hmm. Start with them. And just, and you'll be surprised how that will help you. Because you will remember. You'll remember that person, what you did with them, the relationship you had, mm -hmm. etc. And oh, by the way, wouldn't you want to be remembered when you die? Mm -hmm. There are things happening in these memorial services, I'm convinced, and graveside services that are a part of our spiritual healing. Mm -hmm. When we re that. remember someone, I think of her father, I think of my father, I think of her mother, all these, my mother, all these people. We have them in mind at these times, and we hopefully gotten past anything negative that might have been about it right and to focus on the beautiful part of that mm -hmm. let that rise up mm -hmm. and go away from there with less burden yeah i know yeah. that's happens yeah. when it works right with me mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. her father as much as i meant as she does yeah i would say you mentioned, mentioned that that's very important marcos when you pray for these people you, when I said you remember them, that's assuming you had some good remembrances yeah. in, in terms of if they were helpful. And, and, and let's be honest, I don't know about you. The older I get, the more I see my parents and me, or me and my parents, depending on how you want to look at it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. All right. It's not all positive. All right. Now, the other side of that coin, though, is as, as you look at that, <clears throat> take somebody who did not have a good upbringing. And was abused or something like that you know that could be a very traumatic thing they may even need to have them on the list even more 
and pray for them even more. That's the point. It's not you pay, you don't pray, pray just for the people who loved you and did good to you. You pray for who are we to love in the New Testament? Our enemies. Our enemies. Those who abuse us, those who, who treat us ill. Those, that's when you know you're, you've made it along the Christian ladder, is when you can pray for and mean it for somebody that you don't like and don't get along with and maybe an enemy. Amen. Amen. That's, my, mother, my mother was an angel on earth. I remember mentioning heaven. My mother was an angel. Mm -hmm. My father was hell on earth. Mm. And I prayed for my mother so because you, I loved her. But who needs it more? He does. He does? He does. He does Think of it this way. Think of your children. Let's say you have different children. And one goes up to be president of the United States. The other one goes up to be governor. And the other one goes up to be a senator and a lawyer and a teacher and then this. And then you have one kid over here who is the black sheep of the family. Who needs the prayers the most? Yeah. Of course. Yes. Uh, Marco? Well, this is, this is almost too rich. Right? Yeah, it's, it's heavy stuff. And I was thinking of the, the moral eyes for the dead. <clears throat> in love your enemies. Mm -hmm. Something that disappoints me personally is to see how I'm no better than anybody else to want to hate somebody that's really doing evil things. We're supposed to hate the evil, the evil, yeah. right? The person, yeah. And yeah. then separate we, the sin from the sin. Christ in our hearts. Mm -hmm. It's almost, I guess, it is almost impossible to hate that person. Just, right. Understand what right. Jesus said on the cross and forgive right. them, Father. No, not what they do. Yeah. But the thing that really is sad is when we see an Orthodox Christian community, long term friends that are caught up in the politics of this and they begin hating yes. different and they are there on a mad rant mm -hmm. about and it's pure hate. Oh, yeah. And we, we see too much of this. Mm -hmm. We cannot get. By with hating somebody because we're in danger of our own salvation. Right, right. Yeah, it's very difficult because the devil will work hardest where people yeah. are trying to uh, find Christ the most. Yeah. And so where does that occur? In families and in Christian communities yeah. many times. And so you'll see divisions, you'll see this and that, and yet you have to keep hope mm -hmm. because all you have control over is you. Mm -hmm. You cannot control anybody else. Okay, let's uh, go on here. Uh, Nancy, uh, 3, 18 to 20. 18 to 20. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. There were many other exhortations I preached to the people, but Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evil which Herod had done, also added this above all that he shut John up in prison. Okay. And we're going to stop with this. So, 18 to 20. Why was Herod the Tetrarch angry with John? Because you're supposed to something that goes against you. Yeah, he said, who are you to tell me? Yeah. All right, who are you to tell me, okay? Yeah. Now, is there a note on that one? Uh, well, yeah, just for 19, it says there, his brother Philip's wife, Herod, had divorced his own wife and married Philip's wife, Herodias, while Philip was still living. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll end just with this uh, uh, 6B, the question there, do political leaders in countries of today rely on the council of religious figures <laughs> If so, so whom do they rely on? Let's start with our own country. Oh, uh, we're in the question and answer period there? Six. Six, 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 six B. Six. Do political leaders in countries of today rely on the council of religious no. figures? If so, whom do they rely on? No. If you were to say, uh, let me give you this scenario. Back in 1960s, okay. whom do you think any president would rely on? Kennedy, Kennedy Michael Bill probably Graham. even would you think he would have the, the relationship with the Pope Bill at that Graham. time? They talk to Billy, Billy Graham. Graham. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Oh. Billy Graham. Oh. If you look at a lot of religious leaders, and especially when Graham died, and oh by the way, there are a lot of Orthodox hierarchs at that uh, ceremony in North Carolina. If you ever go back and look at the footage. But anyway, when Billy Graham, he was an uh what do I to call it? An uh, Counselor to a lot of the presidents. Mm -hmm. A lot of them respected him for so much. Why did they respect Billy Graham versus anybody else? What made Graham at that time 
do you think such a trusted figure in the religious community to rely? I think he should record everything. He told him like it was. He told, he told him like it was. He was on. Yes. He based it on the Bible. He based yeah. it on scripture. Mm -hmm. All right. Was the message complicated or simple? No, simple. No. What was the message? Repent. Repent. <laughs> it was John's <laughs> message. Oh, Repent and come to Christ. In fact, at the end of each service, they would play the song, and what would they people do? Come down to the and what would happen there, by the way? When they brought the people down to the front there where he was speaking, who did they meet with eventually? Do you, do you know advisors? That? Advisors. Oh. They were prayer warriors. Oh. They would go one on one and take the people aside. And they would, in my estimation, people, you see tears and all coming out. They were making a confession. The people probably couldn't remit the sins, but they were confessing to Christ and they were telling them, now repent. You have repented. Now come. Now, the good thing about the people who helped make this, they were called, they were part of the Campus Crusade for Christ. They were out in California. And they were good at getting people to come to Christ. The reason they became Orthodox was they said, after we got them to Christ, we didn't know anything about worship. Mm -hmm. It was mostly rely on the music and the sermon. So they started going to Orthodox churches. They went to Rome. They went to all over different places. Mm -hmm. And they came back and became Orthodox. Okay. Because they found the worship that they were lacking in the Protestant circles. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back and say, all right, after Kennedy and so forth mm -hmm. others, whom did you see? In the last couple of years, who would you rely on? Who would the presidents rely on, if anybody? Who do you? Um, guy from Georgia. Oh, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy, Jimmy, well, well, he was president. Jimmy? No, but who would who would he rely on? <laughs> who does Biden rely on? On Jimmy Carter. Uh, yeah, but what religious leader would he rely on if he does? He, talk, he, he, he tries to align or associate with the Pope. With the Pope. Yeah. But he, he huh. I don't know his relationship locally. Uh -huh. But if you go to Washington, D.C., they normally go, does anybody know where a lot of presidents would go? National him? Cathedral. The National Cathedral, which is under what uh, denomination? Church. Episcopalian. Episcopalian. Oh, okay. It's the Anglican Church. If you get a chance, it's not too far from the Greek Orthodox Cathedral and the Russian Orthodox Church, the cathedral. But in Washington, you see, they'll always go and you'll see them at the National Cathedral, which is basically Anglican. All right. Now, I uh, there's a guy in Texas named Jeffries. When you saw President right. Trump, he would rely on That's Jeffries. Right. He can speak very well. When I lived in San Antonio, there was another man there. They had, in other words, they start to Jeffers. associate with certain people. Jeffers, Jeffers. Jeffers. Mm. But uh, there was another one down there. And you start to see that there, you're going to get counsel. Now, in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, there are chaplains. So there are chaplains there that they can go, they'll pray every day, and they you can go and talk to them. Now, most will develop a relationship with these individuals. I worked with one. He's the one in the Senate right now. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, and so he was, uh, he's African-American, Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, very, very, well, I told you about this before. His grandmother would not let him go out to play until he memorized scripture. And so he is very knowledgeable of Holy Scripture. And he's in the Senate today. Uh, Barry is his first name. I, on, I saw him on YouTube a long time. Yes. You'll see him at different, uh, very distinguished, very personal, uh, not personal, very uh, distinguished and very um, wise, wise in his own way, hmm. etc. But anyway, uh, what I'm getting at here is you would hope that these leaders would have somebody to rely on. Just like we would say you have a father confessor, they need a religious confessor. Now, whether they take advantage of that or not is up to them. All right. But that, I think, going back to what I said before, if you're going to make decisions, whether you're a Supreme Court uh, justice, you're a senator or house, a representative in the House or anybody, you would hope you would have a basis on which that de decision is made as you go from there. Okay. So, any last, we're going to stop there. We have five minutes left. Uh, we did not get through everything. Um, 
we got down to on the question and answer page three. And so what we're going to do next week is start with the baptism of Christ. It's on uh, page 1369, beginning with verse 21. You can take these home, but bring them back mm -hmm. because we haven't finished them. So we still have page three and page four to uh, complete. And uh, when we do that, we'll see how it goes, how it flows, to be honest with you. If we want to stay in Luke, we can. I already have, uh, Ekaterini gave me a very good book on uh, The Lord is My Shepherd, the 23rd Psalm. I've completed the intro in the first two chapters. In fact, I, I stopped today in particular because I did not want to go too far until if we choose to go down that road, I want to just deal with the first two chapters. So Also, Dora brought this book today. That oh, and yes, and Dora mentioned last week a book entitled Lost Books of the Bible. And um, the Gospels, Epistles, and other pieces now extend attributed to the first four centuries of Jesus Christ. And so, um, if I may, uh, could I take that and borrow it, uh, Dora, and then I'll bring it back and share yes, it and look at that, yes. too. I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions or comments before uh, we finish and say the prayer tonight? Okay, so, uh, oh, this uh, will meet the next two weeks. And then the last Monday of this month, Father has, I believe, a... A, a commitment of service. Okay, teaching, teaching the 31st. Uh, what is it? Teaching liturgy. Teaching liturgy. So okay. what we'll probably do, look at your schedules. If you wanted to meet on a Tuesday that week or a different day, we can do that. Or we can just bypass that one week and go on to the next. Let me know. Think about it. But we're good for the next uh, two Mondays. Okay? So let's stand and finish with the prayer. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Lord, our God, that again on this occasion, you have opened our eyes to the light of your wisdom. You have led in our hearts with the knowledge of truth. We entreat you, Lord, help us always to do your will. Bless our souls and bodies, our words and deeds. Enable us to grow in grace, virtue, and good habits, that your name may be glorified. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.